Hi everyone, uh, I'm Liam Eagle, I'm the editor here at the Webhost Industry Review, and I would like to welcome you all to another of our WER webinars. Uh, today's session is called Living on the Edge, Why All Hosts Should Offer CDN Services, and it's going to feature a presentation from uh, Rebecca Wetzel of Net Forecast and uh, Costin Metrovelli of ONAP. Uh, and I will let Rebecca and Costin introduce themselves properly in a moment, uh, but before we go any further, I'm just going to take care of a few house housekeeping items. Um, first of all, uh, questions. Uh, we're going to have some min uh, some time saved at the end of the whole presentation uh, for your questions. However, you can feel free to submit them throughout the session. Uh, you'll find there's a there's a submit a question function in the webinar software, and uh, I'll be keeping an eye on those throughout the presentation. And you know, if there's a if there's an opportune moment, I will put those to the presenters uh, for those questions where I can't find a polite spot to interrupt. We're just going to save those until the end. Um, if you do ask a question and it doesn't get answered, either because we run out of time or because maybe it's a bit too specific uh, to answer or to address in you know this form, uh, rest assured that we will have a record of all the questions and who asked them, and somebody will certainly reach out to you via email or some other way after the webinar. Uh, if you do have a question that you'd just rather ask outside of a public forum like this, uh, there will be some contact info on screen later in the presentation during the Q&A period, so you can definitely wait for that and just reach out directly to... Uh, folks that way. Uh, as always, there will be a video archive of the webinar uh, available after the fact, and if you want to revisit a slide or a part of the presentation or share it with somebody else, uh, it'll be in the archives at thewar.com slash webinars as of early next week, and it'll be there alongside a lot of other uh, great past webinars, including uh, several others that involved ONAP, so that is definitely worth taking a look. Now, uh, without any further ado, I will turn things over to Rebecca, and we can get things started. Thank you, Liam, and hello, everyone. Um, I work for NetForecast, and uh, NetForecast is a uh, technology consulting company that specializes in application performance management and all of the technologies and uh, 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 management techniques around improving performance. Now, can everyone see my slides? Just checking in here. Uh, not just yet. Okay, let me just say, I have to accept this. There we go. Now, can everyone see? Yeah. Okay, excellent. And um, what I'm going to be talking about today is from the perspective of a, of a cloud hosting provider or a more traditional hosting provider, why should you consider offering content uh, delivery services? What possibly is in it for you. And I'm going to first go over what are um, content delivery network services, CDN services. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, already know that, but there may be a few of you who might need a refresher as to what the heck are these things. I also am going to talk about why you should care, why you might want to offer them, what might be the consequences if you choose not to offer them, uh, what are your uh, deployment uh, options should you choose to go that route? And then um, I have some final comments at the end, um, things to think about. Now, the, um, excuse me while I get rid of um, something that's blocking my upper right screen. Um, what is a CDN service and why does it exist? Well, essentially it exists so that uh, a content owner can uh, improve the experience of their end users and do so, in this case, by distributing the content from the edge of the network through a distributed system of servers in, in multiple uh, data centers in multiple geographies. and um, the idea is essentially to overcome the effects of, of latency on the customer experience by, uh, um, by pretty, putting that content close to users and not having to go back to the origin server every time. Now, the CDN services can work in a couple of different ways, and you as a service provider can control uh, in many cases, how it works um, by uh, 
directing content requests to an optimal location, with optimal being your definition of optimal, you can um, uh, reduce the number of hop counts, you can, or, or you know, determine that you want to uh, choose a route based on the lowest number of hop counts or the fastest uh, uh, network time, or you could determine that it's, it's, uh, it's really a compromise between the fastest user experience for the price. If you, if you are very um, uh, sensitive to, uh, to price. Um, and then from your point of view as a hoster, there's yet another way to look at what it, a CDN service is. And that is, if you look at it from a high level view, it is really definable as hosting, as you do today, only rather than being centralized hosting, it is distributed hosting and it extends what you do today into uh, a much broad, broader footprint uh, out towards your users. And, and that is important because I think that um, sometimes we think of a CDN service as a completely different critter from hosting. But conceptually, it's not. And um, so when you think about delivering the service and selling the service and how you um, consider bundling it, for example, I'm just putting this thought in your head it's useful to think of it as a continuum and not uh, a, a not something that's so totally different as, as we have tended to think of it until today. Um, one of the um, additional or, or several additional points of benefits uh, of, of uh, the service to end users is not just the faster experience but also it can offload, um, it can offload uh, traffic off of your network. It can also protect against DDoS attacks. And uh, so there, there are many other things that uh, you might want to um, consider in terms of why your customers would care. Now, why would you want to offer CDN services from, um, you know, from from your point of view, it can satisfy your, your customers' uh, need to improve their end users' experience region by region, um, and that benefits your business. Obviously, you want to have happy customers. It also can provide you with, uh, will provide you if you offer it, with an, uh, a new revenue stream. Now, um, we're all looking to build, the, build our businesses, and uh, this is one way to do it by satisfying the needs of your existing customers uh, with, the, with a new service in your service portfolio. It also enables you to compete on a more even footing with others in your business, especially um, it um, it can allow you to offer a portfolio that um, is uh, more equivalent to <clears throat> some of the behemoths like um, Amazon Web Services and others. It also can promote customer loyalty. One more reason for your customers to stay with you. Now, in terms of the end user experience, Speed really does matter, and a number of, um, of studies have borne this out. Uh, Compuware Gomez, who um, does um, performance measurement for a living, uh, they've done a number of studies, and these are just a few of the examples of the results of those when um, you know, they found that um, improving uh, load times from 8 to 2 seconds uh, improved conversion rates by 74%. And in another study that they did, uh, load 
time improvements from six to two seconds, lowered abandonment rates by uh, abandonment rates by 25%. And Walmart, who knows a thing or two about retailing, recently um, published some information on their experience with their own website, and uh, they have uh, done the analysis to show that for every 100 uh, uh, milliseconds that they that they uh, improve a page load time. For them, um, there is a, a, a definite correlation with uh, increased online revenue of 1%. And 1% for Walmart is pretty good. And uh, caused them to, to stand up and take notice. And, for, and they also noticed that uh, for every one second improvement, um, their conversion rate uh, went up by, by 2%. Here's uh, graphic that uh, they have put out that shows what happens to conversion rate when um, uh, correlated with uh, page load times. And you can see that between one and four seconds, you've got uh, a big uh, decrease in their conversion rates. And then you've got this really long tail. Um, uh, going off to the right, that uh, where it's it's fairly flat, but you know between one and four seconds, you're really going to lose a lot of of um, people's attention if you uh, if you are outside of that range. So what happens if you say this isn't for me? I'm not going to um, offer CDN services. Well. It's really something you should think about seriously because for those businesses in, who really need to have a good customer experience so that they don't lose people through that uh, um, load time um, degradation off to the right in the last uh, chart, somebody else is going to get their business because they're going to do this. and you can either, or they, your customers, will have really two choices. They can either uh, take their hosting business away from you to, and uh, give it to somebody who also offers CDN services like um, AWS or, or GoGrid or Rackspace. A lot of people, a lot of uh, hosters out there are adding this to their offerings. And if you do not do it, there's a risk that your customers may say, I'll see you later for somebody who does. Or they can keep their hosting business with you and then buy standalone CDN services from, from some of the players uh, which you've probably heard like Akamai or Limelight or some of, some of the other smaller players that are also in this business. It is, by the way, a big business. As a matter of fact, uh, the CDN the CDN business today is about a three billion dollar business, and it's expected to reach five billion in the next three years. So there's money to be made here, and uh, you should consider whether or not you'd like to be on the receiving end of some of that. So, if you do make the decision that uh, this is something you want to pursue, you have a number of deployment options at uh, at your disposal. There are three main ones. One is you can do it yourself. You can put all of the infrastructure in place and software to deliver your own CDN services. Um, some of the big guys have chosen to do that. Um, they do not outsource their, their CDNs. They've done it themselves. The pros of doing that are you don't need to share anything with anyone. Any money that comes in is yours, and all the infrastructure and all the headaches are also yours. Um, the downside of that is it's very expensive, and it's really hard to get broad reach, uh, much less global coverage with that option. It is a major investment in time, energy, and manpower. Um, the more common 
choice of today is to become a CDN reseller. That is to take the services of one of the dedicated CDN companies and um, very easily and in some cases instantly you can implement it. You've got your global reach. You've got uh, low capital and operating uh, expenditures associated with that and you're good to go. The downsides of that are that the percentage share of the revenue that you will receive as a reseller will be uh, relatively small and um, your, your bargaining power in, in that uh, environment is going to be relatively limited. Now, what's of, of uh, very much interest to me is a new option added to the, um, uh, the, the two that have been around for a while. And that is uh, to join a CDN federation. And um, you may not be familiar with um, this idea of, of federation, but you will be hearing more about it as time goes on. And, and uh, federating through CDN is, is something that's, um, I would say, a beachhead to other kinds of uh, federation for other services. And the idea is that you join forces with other hosting providers to create your, a shared infrastructure from existing hosting infrastructure. And that infrastructure can be devoted to, um, to delivering CDN services. And what you're doing is you can take advantage of other providers' access capacity to deliver services, in this case CDN services, to your customers. And conversely, they can essentially rent your space in your um, in your uh, facilities uh, spare capacity that that you may have to deliver CDN services to their customers. In this federation model, uh, third party does the uh, deployment. Uh, and operates the service, so you don't need to be getting into that business, but you need to be able to make available your resources and others to make available their resources in order to be part of this um, of this federation. And the third party serves as a transaction broker, so the money um, comes and goes based on who's doing what and what gets used. The pros of this um, of this model are that, um, like the reseller model, you have the low CapEx and OpEx, you've got higher revenue coming into you than you would get from reselling, and you've got this global reach. Plus, you get paid uh, when others use your infrastructure to provide services to their customers. So there's really, uh, there's really quite an interesting model at work here. and it has a few downsides. One is that you, it requires a common management platform and you don't have direct control over service quality, but you are part of a group who obviously are all going to have some alignment of common interests in ensuring that their, their customers' needs are being seen. And so you're not just um, um, at the mercy of, uh, of as a reseller often is, you are actually, you are it. You, you are the way in which these services get delivered. You are part of the, of the uh, collective, shall we say. So OnApp is one of the first companies to offer uh, federated uh, CDN services. And um, they're really pioneering this in a way which is, is quite interesting. I've been watching what they've been doing for, um, for the whole time that they've been doing it. <laughs> Actually, uh, the federated piece, uh, that is. And um, <clears throat> they offer three different business models, which um, I think will be, each of which will be interesting to a subset of you out there. In, the, in their federated model, you can either combine your points of presence with other members' points of presence, or you can use 
other members' points of presence exclusively and direct the content of your hosting um, customers to their POPs, or, or you can use your infrastructure exclusively. So there, there are these three options which I have um, spent <laughs> quite a lot of time figuring out how to show. And in slide 15, I um, have my depiction of exactly how this works. So you've got you and your, your content customers uh, hosting customers in, in blue. And then uh, representative other hosting providers, B and C, in, in red and yellow here. And ONAP provides what um, uh, could most accurately be called a, a CDN platform, and man, which is largely management software, and, and Costin can go into more detail on how they deliver what they deliver, um, that essentially brings all of the data centers together to, to form one um, service platform that can then uh, enable you to deliver your customers' content from these other data centers with the users out there to the right. And then off to the left, you've got the brokerage aspect of it, the money flow, and you've got <clears throat> the green arrows going from the content owners who pay to have their content uh, delivered from various points around the world, close to users, and that money flows to this brokerage service and then to the other service providers as you use their infrastructure and from them to you as they use your infrastructure. So that is the combined POP model. And then there's the use other others POP model, POPs models model and that as you can see on the on the plat in the platform box, your uh, infrastructure need not or is not in this model included in the delivery platform. It could be that you have um, you know a variety of reasons for not wanting to be um, delivering CDN services from your infrastructure, but you want to take advantage of others, so you can do that, and it's essentially uh, the same idea only. Uh, you don't need to be um, contributing your infrastructure to uh, to the collective. And then in the final model, <clears throat> the use your own POPs model, you can use the um, the platform and the um, and the service, the brokerage piece, to deliver what is essentially your own uh, CDN, um, using all your own infrastructure to, uh, to your um, uh, hosting customers and users, and not include the rest of the world in it. So it's, it's quite a flexible model, and depending on your particular set of needs, you can uh, choose to uh, go one of these three routes. Now, a couple of concluding remarks. One is, what is what does all this mean in terms of uh, enabling you to compete uh, with others? Well, one way that uh, I like to look at it is this is this is a really exciting time, and the internet is enabling some small to medium-sized hosting companies to come together, um, and I hope you don't take this amiss, but, but think of it as the ants in the internet anthill are coming together and working together to create something that individually they could not create, but together they can create a worldwide footprint and a CDN service um, in this federated model to compete and an even footing against the really big guys, and to do it even better in some cases because 
if enough service providers get together, you can provide global reach in every world nook and cranny that an Amazon is never going to reach because they have, you know, their big data centers near the power sources and uh, and really not as many places as you could if you um, if you pool your resources. So it it really positions you not only conceptually to to take advantage of uh, CDN services, but looking beyond that, um, it, in in my view, is is just the first step towards true cloud federation, where you can um, federate your your ability to deliver um, hosting uh, cloud hosting services over a big bigger footprint as well and then add other uh, features on that as well as application performance and, and security who knows it, it really um, it could just go on and on um, and the final um, thought I'd like to leave you with is that I've I've covered a lot of this material in a report which uh, is going to be sent to the uh, participants in this webinar uh, as a follow-up and will also be posted on the Net Forecast website and also the ONAP website at uh, in the next couple of weeks. So with that, um, I'm I'm done with uh, my portion of things. Uh, be happy to accept questions at at the end. Uh, I understand that uh, people can write in their questions at any time, and I, I look forward to hearing. Uh, and, and answering, if I can, any questions that you might have. So, Kostin, over to you. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Kostin Metravelli. I'm Chief Commercial Officer at ONAP. Um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about how all of these things that Rebecca's just discussed, um, how, those, uh, how ONAP has actually um, brought those to life. So just a quick uh, description of ONAP for those of you not familiar with us. Um, ONAP provides cloud CDN and storage software uh, that enables service providers to deliver a full-featured, globally-oriented cloud service that allows them to compete with the likes of Amazon Web Services. So let's take a look at the problem here. Really, the key problem is that applications are, uh, today's applications are by their nature global. Um, the sorts of applications that are moving to cloud, like gaming, media, e-commerce, social media, software as a service, etc., um, have an inherent global audience, and it's really important that applications are able to um, are able to be deployed in a way that uh, makes those instantly available, ensures that there is very low latency, um, and that they perform uh, in a way that customers expect. Much like the um, the retail uh, examples of how latency. Um, affects uh, uh, how latency affects uh, sh buyers' shopping behavior that Rebecca talked about. So the big problem here is that service providers are local. Um, they have limited, often have limited scale, a few, um, a smaller, a smallish number of data centers, um, not very many locations, and um, so it's very difficult to offer that sort of global reach that customers are looking for. So in order to get that global reach, um, it, it's, one needs to build a global infrastructure. Um, but of course, that is extremely expensive. And um, the, the likes of Amazon have been able to achieve this. Um, but for regular service providers, um, switching on a new data center uh, is a massive investment. Um, and so it becomes, it becomes a very capex intensive task to open up uh, a vast range of data centers uh, across the across the globe. So that's why we at ONAP believe that the future of cloud is federated. We think that service where service providers can club together to share their infrastructure and um, therefore offer end customers uh, a seamless uh, single service, um, a single seamless cloud service, or if you care to think, if you if you care to think of it as a, a giant global cloud of compute, then it gives customers the ability to deploy those applications um, that require global reach in a very simple way. 
and certainly at a scale that something like that even something like Amazon cannot compete with. So that's really where the on-app CDN um, has has come from. The on-app CDN is really the first application that sits on top of this global federation. Um, OnApp, as a company, has over 400 service providers using the OnApp CDN, using the OnApp Cloud platform. What we've done with the OnApp CDN platform is uh, allow those service providers to contribute their spare infrastructure to a marketplace to create uh, an instant global CDN, pretty much. Today, that CDN has 100 points of presence, over 100 points of presence, across over 34 countries. We've managed to achieve that scale um, within a 12-month period, um, and uh, if you look to, if you try to achieve that using traditional methods of building out your own data centers, um, uh, clearly that would be uh, that would be a virtually impossible task. So, uh, we expect this federation to continue to grow, um, and uh, and therefore, as it grows, can add more and more value to uh, to users of the CDN. So at the heart of this is a global marketplace. So it's essential, obviously, for, um, for service providers who are contributing, contributing their infrastructure to be able to, um, to, be able to uh, make money out of that. Um, and for people, for the service providers who are um, consuming the CDN, i.e. They're, they're sending customers traffic across the CDN, um, it's essential to make sure that they get billed accurately. So that's where the on-app marketplace comes in. So first of all, it allows customers to buy capacity. It allows customers to buy capacity. So if you want to create a CDN, you can uh, create a CDN using your own points of presence, i.e., your own data centers. You may have one in New York and in Chicago. However, you want to expand your data. You want to expand your CDN to include London, Amsterdam, Par um, Paris, Tokyo. Uh, what you would do is simply come to the on-app marketplace, select those, select service providers and those service providers' points of presence in those locations, press a button, and your CDN is instantly available um, at those with those locations. The great thing is that there is one single agreement that you have with on-app. Uh, you don't have to have multilateral. Uh, you, you don't have to have unilateral agreements with each of those service providers that you're that you're participating with. At the same time, the technology is seamless. So again, ONAP deals with all of the routing of traffic to all of those CDNs, sorry, to, to all those points of presence appropriately. On the other side, if you're a service provider who has spare capacity in your data center, then you can contribute it to this marketplace. Um, so that allows you to really monetize that spare resource that, otherwise, that is otherwise just sitting there depreciating. Um, that resource is made available globally on the marketplace and provides really this new source of revenue uh, that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And once again, ONAP is acting as a single clearinghouse. So what that means is that at the end of the month, uh, you're getting, uh, at the end of the month, you're getting um, a check for the, vol for the volume of traffic that's gone across your CDN point of presence that you've contributed to the marketplace. ONAP sits in the middle providing this brokerage service. So as I mentioned, we have um, on the ONAP CDN over 100 points of presence today, and you can see a list of them here, over across uh, over 34 countries. Uh, if you want to dig into that, then uh, these are all available on the ONAP uh, website as well. So we allow customers to participate in the ONAP CDN in multiple different ways. So um, there are customers who may want to create just their own private CDN and not participate in the marketplace at all. So they want to create, a, they have enough data centers uh, that they want to, that they can create a CDN um, based on points of presence within their own infrastructure. And that's entirely possible using the ONAP CDN, using the ONAP CDN product. They can simply switch on those points of presence and um, uh, they can, and uh, they can start to sell that. Second model is the federated CDN. So this is um, really the most common mode that our customers are using um, the on-app CDN in, which is where they have um, one or more points of presence uh, that they own, so their own infrastructure. 
they can switch on those points of presence uh, within their infrastructure and then select from the marketplace um, points of presence across the rest of uh, across the rest of the globe uh, to build the sort of uh, reach that they want to and indeed uh, it's entirely possible to, for, for a service provider to build multiple CDNs so you might want to have a CDN that covers um, that covers just the US and Europe one that covers the US Europe and Asia um, and you can obviously charge differently for those you can even create custom CDNs down to the granularity of a single customer so you could create a CDN that entirely that, that is entirely bespoke to an end customers needs so if that end customer doesn't want to pay money for distributing traffic to a particular geography you can create a CDN that just leaves out that geography we also have customers creating virtual CDNs so this is where they really own no infrastructure themselves and they simply build a CDN um, based on points of presence from within the marketplace so this is a pretty exciting model where uh, whereby um, they have no capex um, they have no capex at the um, at the start of uh, the start of creating their CDN uh, and can get to market extremely quickly um, so Rebecca obviously talked about these models as well there is one fourth one uh, which isn't particularly common um, but this is where this is service providers who provide uh, who are net contributors or uh, sorry are pure contributors to the on app marketplace so this is service providers who have spare infrastructure that can be contributed to the marketplace but don't uh, but don't um, provide their own CDN service to their end customers so that's entirely possible as well but is much less common um, in the on-app CDN world so as you can see there's a lot of flexibility there so now I'll give you a couple of customer stories um, so give you some real-life examples of how customers are using this first of all Dediserve um, Dediserve is one of a new breed of cloud provider uh, they've grown in a very impressive way by offering a better than Amazon AWS service um, so for example offering better service levels and better pricing uh, that business customers need CDN was the next logical service area after cloud so it was a way to add value to the cloud service um, it's very simple for their customers to spin up a um, to spin up a cloud application on a VM and push it to multiple locations around the world what's interesting is that Dediserve uh, is definitely not shy of investing to expand its own footprint with new infrastructure so they've acquired other hosts and they've got multiple locations um, multiple data centers in fact they just launched a new cloud in New York this week um, so as you can see um, Dediserve think that this uh, this technology um, is particularly uh, important to their success to look at another service provider UPX um, UPX came to federated CDN from a different direction they launched about 10 years ago and were the first CDN company in Brazil. They specialize in audio and video streaming, um, and so they already had their own platform. But the ONAP federated CDN model gave them a simple way to accelerate performance for HTTP content as well alongside their streaming platform. Um, the benchmarking company Sedexis recently rated UPX as the fastest CDN in South America, um, just one month after deploying the ONAP CDN. And finally, a new breed of federated CDN provider. So this is uh, CDN77.com. This is a very exciting company um, and uh, another uh, example of a service provider beating Amazon on reach, service, and price. Their CDN is built, uh, they're, they're, pr they're pretty much one of these virtual CDN providers that I mentioned before. Their CDN is built almost exclusively from federated resources, from capacity provided by other hosts around the world bought through the marketplace and it's been very cool to see how quickly these guys have grown since they started working with us so in the space of a year um, the CDN 77 have been able to build a service and brand that compares favorably to and out delivers most of the legacy CDN providers out there on the market so let's let's have a quick recap um, what is uh, what is the on app federated CDN um, allowing you to do well first of all it allows you to build your own white label CDN this is your CDN you can use your own points of presence within your own data centers and you can use marketplace points of presence to expand your reach time to market is extremely fast we can get you up and running within a matter of days 
and it also it also most importantly makes it easy to increase your profitability. So you can offer high margin CDN services. All of the um, all of the uh, on app marketplace resources are sold on a pay as you go basis, um, and you can also create additional revenue streams from by by contributing your spare infrastructure to the on app marketplace. So now we're going to go to questions. So over to you, Liam. Okay, great. Thanks, Gustin. Um, listen, while we're here, um, does Rebecca, would you mind just mentioning what your email address is if you wanted to also have that available for people? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, simply Rebecca, R-E-B-E-C-C-A, at net forecast. That's N-E-T-F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T dot com. Okay, great. So I have a few questions, a lot, of, a lot of which have to do with some of the nuts and bolts of, of how ONAP uh, CDN uh, will deal with certain situations. Uh, but uh, I think the first thing I'd like to address, because I think this will help inform how we address some of these questions, is um, now with the uh, consuming of the federated CDN resources uh, and uh, sorry, by a hosting provider's customers, do they, does a hosting provider who's participating just take the, the marketplace as is and just uh, expose that to their customers, or do they, do they take the resources they want to use and, and package those for their customers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's actually, they can actually do it in multiple different ways. So um, one of the easiest ways to provide this to an end customer is to simply um, create one or more CDN offerings. So perhaps you create you know, a, a you, you create a um, a U.S. CDN, a U.S. and Europe CDN, um, a a global CDN, etc. You know, whatever flavors you want to create, price them as you, as as is appropriate, um, all based on marketplace resources, and sell those to end customers as a um, you know as those sort of prepackaged CDN um, as prepackaged CDN um, capabilities, so or services. So um, that's a very easy way to to uh, for, for service providers to get started. If they want to be more sophisticated, then service providers can um, uh, can to some you know can indeed expose their end customers to marketplace resources. So they can say, for example, um, you as a customer want to have a CDN that encompasses uh, these particular locations, these particular geographies. Um, and uh, you can create a custom CDN per customer, per end customer, uh, that exactly meets that requirement. And I think really the ultimate expression of that is where you would allow uh, an end customer, um, you, would, you would allow an end customer to um, come in, create their uh, web application within your uh, within your hosting environment, and from their from their um, control panel, uh, you'd do, you'd ask them the question, where do you want to accelerate your content? And uh, give them a list of all of the locations in which they can they can provide the CDN service. Um, they can click those. They could click those. Press a button, and uh, behind the scenes, their own private their own um, bespoke CDN would be created. Um, so they don't even have to know it's a CDN as such. All they need to know is that you're going to take on responsibility for accelerating their web content across all of those geographies. So there are many different ways you can do it. Okay, great. So I think I'm going to try to combine a couple of questions into into one here because I think that there's a there's a sort of issue that I think is you know relevant to a lot of the people. But, um, so somebody asked you know what prevents the members from shifting the traffic to the lowest cost bandwidth provider, which I think and and they can you know resubmit the question if, if I get this wrong. But I think what they're asking is um, you know are there are there checks and balances to make sure that you know uh, you're getting what what the person who uh, com uh, contributed the, the resources to the to federated CDN promises, um, and then somebody else asked, uh, you know, how is quality of service managed across CDN providers? So I think that that's very similar in a very similar vein. Uh, and then somebody else asked. Okay. So yeah, just before we go on, somebody asked what the minimum resources yeah. to join the CDN were. So maybe you could combine those into some answers. Sort of what on ask one on app asks of contributors to the CDN uh, federation, and then also how you manage the quality of the, the resources contributed. 
Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, we have a minimum set of requirements for any service provider who wants to contribute infrastructure to the marketplace. So, obviously, anyone can consume infrastructure from the market and consume um, from the marketplace. But in order to contribute, you have to meet a minimum level of um, there's a minimum level of uh, hardware connectivity, um, uh, storage, etc., that needs to be put in place. Um, so. Uh, you can find those requirements on the ONAP website uh, under the CDN section. Um, the important thing here is that um, once service providers are allowed into the CDN, we do uh, we do monitor on a continuous basis uh, the performance of those points of presence um, and uh, you know continue to, to ensure that uh, those resources are continually made uh, are continually made available and that the um, quality of service on any one pop does not degrade. Now, the um, important thing here is that um, really uh, what's, what's very different about the ONAP CDN is it's based on a marketplace. So um, in, some, uh, in some regards, um, you are going to have different points of presence in any one location that will give you different capabilities. So for example, you might have a point of presence that um, is based on particularly um, high spec infrastructure, you know, SSD storage and all that sort of good stuff. Um, and uh, therefore the service provider who's contributing it to the marketplace can charge a higher price for it. Um, you may have a service provider who has um, a slightly uh, lower spec on the, um, on, the, on the infrastructure they're using um, and uh, therefore they might charge a slightly lower price. Now both of those types of infrastructure have a place because you may want to have a gold-plated CDN, but at the same time, you may want to pay a bit less and have something that's not quite so gold-plated. So you know, there is room for both of those, uh, for both of those instances within, you know, within the CDN. And within the marketplace, we're continually adding new capabilities. One of the critical things there is providing more and more visibility about not only the uh, performance, um, so historical performance of any one point of presence, so that when you go come to subscribe to that point of presence, you can see exactly how it's performed over time, um, but also making sure that uh, you have um, a whole set of metadata around um, uh, other aspects of how that point of presence um, has been uh, constructed. So, for example, does it use SSD storage as just as one sort of uh, as one sort of data point that would appear? So, um, really, the idea here is that uh, it is a marketplace. You can use the marketplace. The marketplace um, will the pricing in the marketplace will differentiate um, high quality from uh, you know the highest quality from um, from other points of presence. Um, and so it's really up to you, the service provider, to decide what sort of CDN you want to create. Is it a gold-plated one, or uh, do you have a little bit more leeway and therefore can take a lower, uh, and therefore can get a better price? Okay, great. <laughs> I appreciate you answering a fairly complex question. Um, so this is a, a briefer question, but probably a you know interesting answer. Um, somebody asked, what happens to the network in the case of a, a DDoS event? So um, obviously, one of the um, one of the advantages of a CDN is that um, it's it's a good way of mitigating DDoS attacks because you have multiple um, you have multiple points of presence um, uh, rather than one single uh, rather than one single site that can be that can be attacked. So uh, you know, it does provide some some um, uh, it does provide some mitigation against those. Um, we we um, work with uh, we work with um, partners um, who are able to provide um, additional capabilities on top of our CDN, like for example a company called Black Lotus, um, who provides specific capabilities to, uh, for example, prevent um, to to uh, they provide specific capabilities targeted at DDoS attacks. So um, uh, you know one of the I think one of the great things about the ONAP Federation is that uh, it's not just about the products that we create. It's actually about products that um, our, uh, our partners, our customers have created that we can bring to the rest of the Federation. And uh, so it's a, it's a good example. OK. Um, sorry. So I guess somebody asked um, a couple of questions about 
contributing again resources to the to the well actually sorry so somebody somebody asked uh, how many points of presence can a provider have which I don't know I don't know if that refers to uh, consuming them or contributing them but uh, maybe you could address both of those ideas and then they asked also sort of what the cost looks like well they said what is the cost of the software for each point of presence although I'm not sure if that's exactly how you price it uh, but maybe you could talk about um, you know what the cost looks like for um, providers involved in the CDN. Sure. So um, a service provider is able to um, contribute um, as many points of presence um, that meet the grade um, as they as they want to to the um, uh, to, to the marketplace, and they're able to consume. Uh, as many points of presence within the marketplace um, as are available. So really, that's kind of uh, that, that, uh, that that's unlimited in both regards. Um, in terms of the uh, in terms of the costs of software, if the customer is an on-app cloud user, so they are already using on-app cloud to um, to provide a cloud service, then the um, the CDN capability is effectively uh, is effectively free. Um, what they are paying for is um, what they what they are paying for is really the um, that there there are two key costs. One of which uh, is what we call CDN as a service cost, which is for any traffic that's transmitted across um, between a customer's um, across a customer's own CDN, i.e., using their own infrastructure, or using um, marketplace infrastructure. So um, that's a uh, that's a simple five dollar terabyte charge. There is then a um, uh, there is then a marketplace fee, which is for traffic that goes across the marketplace, which is um, which is obviously at market price. So uh, that will vary location to location, um, depending on whether this is uh, you know U.S., Europe, Asia Pacific, what the capabilities of the point of presence actually are, and so on. Okay, uh, something that you alluded to in, in the answer to the last question, I think that would be worth clearing up or, or answering specifically, is um, must a, must a, a contributor or, or consumer of the uh, federated CDN be an on-app uh, cloud customer? Uh, oh yes, uh, sorry, that's a very good point. Um, the uh, no, no. So it's important to note that the um, that an on-app um, CDN. Uh, that, that a customer can be purely an on-app CDN customer, so they um, they don't they don't necessarily have to um, they don't necessarily have to um, uh, be a cloud customer as well. If they are if they want to purely um, be a CDN customer, there are some additional costs because they have they have to set up some uh, for, for, there are some additional costs for the software that sits at each of the points points of presence, um, and um, so yeah, that, that's. Uh, there, there is a slight difference there. Okay, so uh, along that, along that, uh, those lines, uh, we had a question, and I think the person may have left, although I don't think it makes the question any uh, less relevant. Uh, so the person says specifically, so they're a hosting provider, they uh, have servers that, that they rent from SoftLayer, and they're using uh, HSphere from Parallels as their sort of automation platform. If they were to uh, become a consumer of the on-app CDN, uh, you know, how would, a, how would a given customer of theirs, uh, you know, use the service? How would they go about setting it up? Um, sorry, so they're, they're within, uh, they have infrastructure within SoftLayer and they're using... They're using like Parallels autom Automation products to automate their infrastructure or their hosting. Yeah, so I mean really the, the key thing about, um, about the ONAP product set is that um, uh, you can you can slice it in lots of different ways. So if you are a um, say you've got some you've got some infrastructure within um, uh, you've got some dedicated servers within software or wherever it is, um, you can convert that to an uh, you can convert that to an on-app cloud. You can use uh, the new on-app storage product to, uh, to to mitigate your storage costs as well. Um, and you can apply the on-app CDN across that to create a point of presence within that infrastructure and subscribe to to other points of presence globally. Um, so, uh, however, you can take any one of those products separately as well. So, uh, if you had an existing cloud management platform within your infrastructure, um, you would simply spin up um, some. You, you would simply spin up on app 
uh, the ONAP CDN product specifically um, within a spare bit of infrastructure within your uh, within your environment, and um, uh, you know you could you could run it like that. Obviously, there are some by running all of the ONAP products together, there are some synergies. It's easier to manage everything's in one control panel and so on. But if you want to run it alongside, um, the, you, you want to run it alongside uh, parallels, then you can do that too. Okay. Um, somebody asked uh, whether the uh, the CDN can offload SSL, and how would that work, and how long does it take to provision? Kasten? Oh no, I think I may have lost Kasten's uh, audio here. So I guess we may have to uh, wrap, wrap things up here. Uh, Rebecca, are you still on the line? I am. Okay, well... Mm -hmm. We seem to have lost Costin, but um, I will uh, I will say that there are a couple of questions that we didn't quite get to uh, that were more specifically about the ONAP, uh, uh, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of the ONAP platform. But uh, I would say that if you did ask a question, that uh, we'll definitely make sure that uh, somebody gets back to you about the answer to that question. Uh, for those of you who had multiple questions about the platform, I think. Uh, Austin's email is on screen. Uh, uh, they'd be happy to answer your questions, I'm sure, if you reached out to them directly. And uh, I think since we're just about at the hour now, uh, probably a good time for us to wrap up. Um, I would like to thank everyone who came out uh, for attending the webinar, uh, everyone who asked a question uh, or listened to the answers to the questions. <laughs> thank you very much for doing that. Uh, Rebecca, of course, thank you very much for uh, providing us with some great information and uh, to Costin, although he seems to have lost, uh, we seem to have lost him, uh, thanks very much to him for some great information on, uh, you know, what, uh, some insight into, you know, something that's really uh, could be a big opportunity for, for hosting providers right now. So uh, I would like to uh, uh, remind everyone, of course, that uh, this webinar will be archived online uh, as of hopefully by the end of this week, but early next week at the latest at thewordcom slash webinars. And uh, thanks again, and have a great day.